Bright Music Channel. I am your host, Mike McWilliams. Welcome, welcome. Let me make my adjustments here. All right, looks good. I am so thankful for all of you guys taking the time to show up and watch the live stream. Whether you're watching this live right now or if you're going to catch it in the rerun, I want to let you know it is greatly appreciated. You spend a little bit of your time with me. Uh, time is a valuable asset, and uh, spending a little bit of yours with me is really appreciated. So thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> well, while we wait for more people to get into the live stream here, let me mute this because I'm going to need this later. Uh, I will catch you up with uh, things <laughs> that have been going on here at the Upstairs to Write Music Studio. Um, as you know, uh, I have some new guitars coming in, and uh, I am really glad to report that they've hit the shore here. I'm waiting for them to clear customs. So that means maybe shortly here, a little bit sooner than I thought, it depends upon the delivery guys, but uh, probably a lot closer than I thought uh, I can show those to you. So maybe by uh, early next week. You don't know. We'll see. Ben Allmark in the house. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for showing up, Ben. Good to see you, sir. Yes, I'm looking forward to that especially that 1980 uh, Studio Lord. That thing is going to be pretty sweet. Mr. Watson in the house. Welcome, welcome. Everybody's checking in. Again, while we're waiting for people to check in, I will just ramble about uh, random things. <laughs> um, what else was on my mind? You know, uh, I just saw a re news report that was talking about YouTube. And it was uh, talking about how there was a video that uh, law enforcement felt was being somehow connected to a crime. And they requested from YouTube to give them all the information of anybody and everybody, uh, names, addresses, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, whoever watched that video. And YouTube gave it to them. <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, that's an interesting thing. But uh, I'll start off tonight's discussion uh, with that kind of uh, news tidbit uh, to put us in the mood for where we're going to be going tonight. Uh, it is, we're here with my channel. Uh, lately, I've been tearing into um, guitar manufacturers or I've been talking about individual guitars and stuff like that, which is rightly so. I mean, we're a, a, a guitar-orientated, rock-orientated, uh, more or less, channel. But uh, there is upstairs to the right music part of it. And uh, tonight, we're going to get into the music aspect, in this case, particularly of the music industry. Ben Allmark. Yeah, YouTube definitely worked for the man. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about that tonight. So, um, let's see here. Uh, let me cue this up. If I can. Yep. So, since we're going down the rabbit hole tonight, I thought I would have theme music for it. Because <laughs> we are definitely going down the rabbit hole tonight. <laughs> By the way, that's the opening bit of my song, Down the Rabbit Hole. And uh, yeah, um, because we were talking about distractions at the end of the last live stream. And, um, you know, I was joking about the eclipse and uh, I made a joke about how P. Diddy was going to use the eclipse to get out of the state secretly. <laughs> and uh, Siggy Sauer in the house. Welcome, sir. Wood industry indeed. Um, and <laughs> that still kind of cracks me up. because That's exactly the kind of BS stuff that you would see uh, out there. Uh, distracting you from things. But sometimes 
the distractions are designed to distract you from the real issues in the stories themselves. And um, I think tonight, like I said, instead of talking about the Epiphone of Gibson or, or Yamaha or Fender, or, you know, wh whoever, Gretsch, to name a few, Harley Benton, I thought we would talk about the music industry in itself again. Every now and then I like to touch upon it. And usually when I touch upon it, I touch upon it in ways to kind of let you know what a really uh, decrepit cesspool the music industry really is. <laughs> There's no other way. I really do believe that Hunter, uh, as Thompson put it best, uh, you know, or look that quote up of what he thought about the music industry. It wasn't wrong music business industry wasn't wrong Siggy sour says it's hard to get motivated to be in bands but if you build a base from the ground up there is money to be made uh, selling your own merch and whatnot yeah and uh i'm glad you said that Siggy. that is actually very apropos for where we're going to start tonight because uh, uh we are going down a rabbit hole kids uh so there is the rabbit hole warning on tonight's uh <laughs> on tonight's live stream. Uh, if you don't like rabbit holes, then I suggest you turn off uh, <laughs> this live stream right now. Uh, but if you do, strap yourselves in because I've got a doozy tonight for you, something to think about. And it's ugly. It's an ugly one. So, But um, it's facts. It's not speculation. It's not conspiracy theory. It's all based upon the facts. And the facts are there, but if you're distracted from looking at the actual facts of the matter with other things, then uh, you really know you really won't know the totality of what you're looking at or what's being presented to you. So I want to start off with a, de a, de a definition um, here. Uh, uh, Ziggy talked about selling uh, merch and doing things like that. I want to talk about the difference between the music business and the music industry. See, I work, and a lot of you guys out there, uh, work in the music business. We are um, quite a different thing that works within this thing called the music industry. Now, I have strove in my professional career since I was very young because I I just got a queasy feeling about the whole thing from day one and my uh, things that I witnessed and saw and did and in, in, kind of back that up is that I never really wanted to be in the music industry. I thought that I could make a good living being in the music business. But what do I mean by that? The terms business and industry are related but have different meanings. A business refers to an organization or entity engaged in commercial, industrial, or professional activities. It can be a sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation, or other forms of organization. Businesses typically produce goods or provide services in exchange for money. So uh, when you're a small band, Ziggy was pointing out, and he's got merch and CDs and and uh you know uh, scan cards and stuff like that uh then you are a business your band is a business um now there's a lot of rules in that and i won't get into that because that's a separate uh, discussion about what it means to be in the music business as you know in that capacity but there's others there's Text. There's producers like me, uh, guys who produce music. Uh, there's uh, guys who rig lighting at shows. There's guys who uh, do the sound, of course. Uh, there are guys like Fern who tune up the instruments and make them uh, straight up and, uh, and fly right. Um, there's a lot of individuals and in, uh, large and small groups of people that make up businesses that are in the music industry within this music industry. On the other hand, an industry refers to a group of businesses or organizations that are involved in similar or related economic activities. So that's a very key point there. For example, 
uh, the music business. Uh, it's a group of businesses. There is, used to be quite a few record labels out there at one time. Now, there is less than a handful, I believe. Okay. But uh, they are a group of businesses uh, that are involved in similar related economic activity. See, what happens to one, it behooves, you know, you know when the, the tide goes up, they say all ships rise and, and the obverse of that as well. And so they got in together and they started creating things like the Universal Music Group, for example, where you have all these other labels underneath that. But it is a, um, an industry. It is an industry. So we've got that definition out of the way. And uh, I, what's this, uh, Six Hour YouTuber, YouTubers does seem like the next evolution. Yeah. Well, it's just one step. Uh, you, you know, uh, it's, you have to have the substance. So if you're bringing something of substance, then of course, it's always that old adage, if you build it, they shall come. <laughs> and it's true. I like that one because it's so true. It's very true. So if you build something entertaining, people will come. Um, but the music business is something that I've worked in. And like I said, a lot of you out there have. Um, when you're in the music industry, this means that you're working at the corporate level in that industry, in one of, of the before mentioned uh, groups, or you're an artist or a sign producer within that industry. In other words, um, let me go back. Let me, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, if you remember, I started these rabbit hole music industry discussions a while back talking about the death clause. And I told you about an artist in the, 60, in the 1960s who was signed to a small label in Los Angeles that had heavy connections to organized crime. And... Um, he, uh, Bobby Darren, I believe was his name. I may be wrong about that. I, I should have, again, looked that one up. But anyway, you can go back and take a look at it. I do believe that was his name. Maybe not. But anyway, in that era. Um, Mickey in the house. Hey, how you doing, sir? Welcome, welcome. Man, you're going to like this one tonight. <laughs> we're, we're going down another uh, rabbit hole here talking about uh, how nasty the music industry is. And I'm setting it up. I'm, I'm taking you guys uh, through this systematically just to paint a picture for you. Now, he wanted to get out of his contract. And uh, the record label basically made him an offer he couldn't refuse. They killed him. And, but they did a really bad job at it because uh, the idea was to murder him, drive him home, put him in the, the, the front of his car, put him in his car and torch the car. But uh, before the guy could successfully torch it, uh, the car was discovered by the, the, the now deceased artist's mother. She looked down and said, okay, now he's home. Went down, ran, ran down, because he'd been missing for days, ran down and found his body. And strangely enough, the manager, the, guy, the owner of the record label, just happened to appear out of nowhere. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> what a coincidence. Smelling of gasoline. <laughs> in the LAD, LAPD, uh, they, uh, in the corner, classified it as a suicide. <laughs> this guy strangled himself and then tried to set himself in his car on fire after that. <laughs> But what happened as a result of that? Well, they had a, an insurance policy on him. And he was literally more worth more debt to them alive. And they collected. Boy, did they collect. That's a story. Of, that's a true story. And it is an example of a death clause that occurs in most artists' contracts. So that's an industry thing. Okay. You and I, 
we wouldn't write any kind of contract like that as a business. And nobody that we would employ. <laughs> hey, man, you know, I want you to be a partner in my business. But tell you what, we're going to take a insurance policy out on you. I'm going to take one out on you that only I can collect on. Your family can't collect on. You can't collect. Nobody can touch. This is for us, you know, for me. Only. And uh, I hope you're cool with that. <laughs> Here, welcome to the company. <laughs> See, you know, that kind of stuff would make any sane person, any sane person say to themselves, hey, you know, maybe I better take a look at the contract if I do uh, get an industry bite. Maybe I should take a closer look at what it is exactly I'm signing up for. I also told you about briefly, I read you a few passages about Laurel Canyon and how that uh, was a complete setup. Most of the artists all came from military intelligence uh, background in terms of their family members or in, the, in some cases themselves. And that goes from the the, the, the you know, uh, Cosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, all the way through uh, Michael Nesmith and the Monkees, and uh, and just you know, just you know, just a lot of folks that were involved in that Laurel Canyon scene, and and I, and, you know, and and by the way, Manson at one time had a record contract, <laughs> and he was connected deeply to the Laurel Canyon scene. So uh, that scene was created as a controlled count, uh, controlled narrative within this counterculture thing that was being stirred up for some reason, for some reason. And again, this is, you know, because we're talking about 50 years ago, this is all this stuff. 60 years ago, all this stuff is, in hindsight, is very clear to us now because we have the documentation and we see that's exactly what it was. Because there's no way that, again, with the Laurel Canyon, just a, another small point, if, I, if you guys aren't familiar with that, again, go take a look at that uh, live stream, uh, that uh, Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, uh, father, uh, was Admiral Morrison, and he was the guy who started the uh, the Vietnam War with his, his ship being the impetus of uh, of the attack that occurred in the Gulf of Tonkin. And there's a picture of Jim Morrison standing on the deck of the ship with his father, and his father's in his full captain's uh, admiral uniform. And Jim it looks like a clean cut Wally Beaver kind of guy. Fast forward a year later. He's leading a counterculture, anti-war, you know, anti-the man kind of uh, uh, band. I guess you could sum them up in their early years as that way. Well, yeah. And um, long hair, hippie clothes. You feel like the, 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 this is like some, this is a stage setting, that these are actors playing parts. Um, there was one musician who talked about how he got his band got brought in and they were being auditioned for a role, a spot that the birds eventually got. His band was up against, they all were brought in the recording studio. It was decided that the birds would be the one, not his. So that means that there's auditions for spots too. So keep that in mind. I'm, I'm, I keep all this stuff in mind that this is the way that I'm not talking about just now. I'm talking about, I'm going back to the 60s because I want to show you that this has been going on for a while. And that if you are, the world is their stage, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, keeping it in the music realm, uh, Frank Zappa famously told us that someday <laughs> the curtains are going and the backdrop are going to come up the lights are going to come on and you're going to see the nothing but a brick wall there. You're not going to see the usual facades that they put up, to, to quote him. And, um, and he, he would certainly knew, know what he was speaking of because he was one of the kings of the Laurel Canyon scene. He was the go-to guy. He was the one that everybody 
went to his log cabin house, the famous log cabin house that he had. He was the king of Laurel Canyon. So, you know, and again, his background with his family is, as I said, intelligence. So there's that. So again, we start, uh, I paint a picture of the industry being auditioning for spaces. Hey, we need another female rapper. Who are we going to bring up to fill in this role that we want to put forward as the counter to our last female? And it and the and it just seems like in the 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 lyric content, the over sexualized uh, content, just this is a race to the bottom with every one that they bring on. A lot of rappers out there, a lot of females. Why do some get chosen over others? You ever feel like they're being auditioned for parts? So there's that, and that's not just within that genre but I'm bringing it forward a little bit to modern days so that you can see that this still goes on. And boy, does it go on. So um, I say all that, I give all that preface <laughs> as usual because I'm going somewhere and it's ugly. And, um, but I think that we are the upstairs to the right music channel. And, you know, if we're going to talk about music, I think we should talk about the highs and the lows. And tonight is one of the lows. It's one of the lows. And I encourage you on your own as usual. Don't take Mike's word for any of the stuff that I've said so far or I'm going to say. I encourage you to always look it up yourself. Uh, do a little digging. I've got a couple of, uh, of, of pages of windows open here of stuff that I've, I looked up to see if what I heard was what I was reading and hearing was was true and the implications of it. Um, so the big story in the states right now uh, is the Puff Daddy, the P Diddy um, escapades coming to light. Uh, his homes were raided. Uh, he was, and you know, I, I like rock music to be frank with you, but I could probably pull up a similar story in one time in the history of rock or another. That's going to read along the same lines as this. So I'm not picking on rap in particular, but it is something that, uh, is the a dominant, uh, force of music these days. And, um, this certain episode within the history of rap <laughs> and the downfall of uh, Sean Combs uh, is certainly something uh, to take a look at, especially while it's fresh and hot. I don't want to look at this 20 years from now or 40 years or 50 now years from now and say, oh, yeah, well, how come we didn't see that when it was going on? <laughs> you know, how come we didn't know that Jim Morrison's dad was an admiral and he, you know, why wasn't that brought out? Hey, isn't it funny that the lead singer of The Doors, the lizard man who, you know, pulls his, 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 his you know, wiener out in front of the audience and gets arrested is the son of an admiral? And why, but not any admiral, <laughs> but an admiral who was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident? See, we, well, we didn't have the internet back then. We didn't have that, 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 that fast turnaround where people could dig into things and look into things and say, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> what's this? Um, so let's look at this PD situation for a, a little bit. Just to give you an idea of how twisted it is, because it's, it's more twisted than it's even, even you would think to yourself if you've been following attention, a pay, a following, a paying any attention, Following along with the story, some of the salacious details are, you know, pretty disturbing. Um, there is a um, gentleman who was a producer, uh, a record producer, uh, a beat maker, I guess you would call him. Um, and uh, he 
brought up a lawsuit against Sean Combs and said, this guy uh, has been doing this, this, and this. And by the way, uh, there's uh, a lot of drugs involved, party drugs everywhere. There's drugs, drugs, drugs. And by the way, all the rooms in all of his houses uh, are bugged and uh, got video cameras. And, you know, this is extending back uh, by some reports uh, to the early 2000s, 2002 to be exact. And by the way, uh, you know, there's a lot of human trafficking and young girls being moved around. Does any of this sound familiar to you guys? If you if you look at it from like as I just painted it, does it sound like something that you just heard a year or so, a couple years ago, with Epstein? Same thing. Wired bug rooms, cameras, trafficking, young girls, drugs. Does this sound familiar to you guys? Okay, so let's you know. Let's put it in, in, in that light. Let's look at it from that. Let's shine that light on it. You know, what is that Prince used to say? That sunlight is the, is the best, uh, best, best kind of bleach? <laughs> so let's shine that light on that. Boy, that sounds familiar to me. Who does that? There's a term for it. It's called brownstoning. When you get brownstone, they basically entrap you with something, doing something that they usually set up (laughs) and say, here it is. (laughs) Please indulge yourself. Never mind, you know, the production crew up in the attic. Um, And they got you. And then they can control you with that information. So, you know, based on, these are the news reports, guys. This is what's reported. Not just that, but what's reported in the actual uh, um, legal document that you can read online. That uh, these houses were uh, wired up with video cameras and stuff. This has been going on for a while. And the drugs and things like that. And so, you know, uh, Okay, you say, Mike, that, that's pretty interesting, but uh, what does that have to do with anything? You know, really, the guy is obviously kind of potentially, allegedly, involved in some creepy stuff. And you would think to yourself, well, maybe he had all the place wired up because he liked to watch himself, you know, do things. No, no there was that, certainly. But uh, no, he had all of his buddies, actors. Musicians, uh, probably more than a few higher up officials, dignitaries, and things like that. Because who doesn't want to go to a Sean Combs party? You know, they were famous. You hear, hey, it's a great party. But Hollywood music industry parties are something that you do not want to participate in. You don't want to go to those parties. I've been, anyway, you don't want to go to those parties because the minute you walk through the door, there is a creepy, you get a creepy vibe. And I don't care where it's at, who's at, maybe it's just the people themselves, but that's how I came across to me and the one or two that I somehow got in. But that's another story for another time. Um, you. Not to say that I saw anything. I'm talking about the vibe. It was chill. Everybody was good, but it just had a creepy vibe. And and I just got a feeling there was more going on, but that's just me. Um, And I was young too, so who knows. But I find that interesting, that there's similarities between the the Sean Combs story as being reported and the Epstein story. So you say to yourself, Okay, you know, this guy, for years, walked around and did stuff that you or I (laughs) would get 
completely, you know, thrown underneath the jail floor. So that's another beautiful thing about being in the music industry is because they, is the fact that, that, that if you're in the club, if you're in that club, then they got folks that will clean up stuff for you. So let's talk about one of those people who cleans up stuff for you. Let, let's, let's go down a little deeper down this rabbit hole. Listed in the lawsuit is by the producer against Sean Combs is a guy named Fahim Muhammad. And he is accused, alleged by this accuser in this lawsuit, of being the fix guy, the fix-it guy. That if you, you know, if uh, Sean Combs, uh, if you work for him, work for him, that if you had a problem doing something, in this case, in the lawsuit, it said carry drugs that this was the guy to call and he had connections with people in order to fix things, to make them go away. Um, within the police departments as well. Now, didn't we just talk about back in the 60s how, you know, the scene, the cops show up to a car reeking of gasoline, a guy obviously strangled, and they determined that it was a suicide. So that lets you know Another deep little thing about the industry is that they got law enforcement, some members of law and some key members, or it doesn't matter. They have the capacity to reach out and to make things happen through that channel. If that doesn't make your blood go chill, then I don't know what's wrong with you. (laughs) You really should should go see a doctor about warming yourself up a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, to the idea that, uh, that that's diabolical, man. And so this guy, Mohammed, who's mentioned in the lawsuit, is being uh, alleged as being uh, the, the fixer hired by uh, Sean Combs. Uh, you would say to yourself, okay, well, that's interesting, Mike. But why is that so deep and diabolical a thing? The guy, you know, this, he's being accused of being this, but obviously he was a head of security for Sean Combs. So, you know, a, guy, as a head of security guy's uh, very job is to, you know, uh, make sure that things go smoothly, especially when somebody's moving around to restaurants, especially somebody high profile like that. They run restaurants, they're going to the club, or going to music events or or, the, or just the movies or, you know, whatever, just for an ice cream. Okay, fair enough. Northern Thrifter, that's why Manson, uh, why Masons are in the right places to pull strings. Well, again, I'm not going to get into that aspect. I'm only, you know, uh, that's an interesting uh, thought, but uh, leaving that aside, putting the esoteric aspects of things aside and just dealing with what's listed in the papers, in the actual lawsuit. Sticking with that. And again, in the case of the event in the 60s, in Laurel Canyon, sticking with just the facts, the facts. Regardless of who's pulling the strings, and we'll get to that in a minute, actually. But, um, but isn't that interesting? So that's his job. This Mohammed guy's job. He was hired by Sean Combs to be his head of security. And you would say to yourself, well, yeah, a lot of that stuff, of course, is if a problem comes up, then this is the guy that you're going to call first because that's his job. Okay, fair enough. But the thing that was found by another YouTuber that I came across uh, and I had to look it up to make sure that uh, he was right. And I suggest that you look it up to make sure that I'm correct. But Fahim Muhammad was Michael Jackson's head of security at the time of Michael Jackson's death. He graduated from Sacramento State University in 2008 with a BS in administration with a kind of an inclination towards real estate investment. 
2008. In 2009, a year later, he was the head of Michael Jackson's security. 24, 25 years old. Again, Jim Morrison on the deck with his dad, and a year later, he's the Lizard King. Kid graduates from, you know, with a BS in administration, a real estate investment. And a year later, he's head of security for the King of Pop. And the guy who is the second person to come into the room when they find his body, Conrad Murray's in there giving him, trying to resuscitate him. And Muhammad comes in the room, second person in the room to see the body. And he's head of security. So you say to yourself, why would Sean Combs hire the guy who kind of screwed up? Because <laughs> it's kind of a screw up. <laughs> because <laughs> not in, in, in a way, this is not a good thing to have the guy who was ahead of security when, when, when Mike kicked off. That's my new head of security. <laughs> that would give me pause. I don't know, again, about you guys out there, but that would certainly give me pause. So, you know, that's wild. That's wild. And that's a fact. That's wild. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Since we're talking about facts, these are facts. Um, he put his real estate uh acumen to uh, good use. Turns out that he bought hundreds of acres of, pro of land and properties in various places. And one of these places is down in uh, San Diego, right up against the San Ysidro border with Mexico. And um, he signed this property over to his son to help get him started in life. You know, and when the news is a kind of a big thing, the news apparently went down there to interview, hey, why did you give your son all this property? And the newscaster points out, because literally if you open up the back door of the house, you're into Mexico. That's how on the border this property was. So but he signed this property over in Sunset. Isn't it interesting, by the way, it was pointed out in the, in, the, in the news that none of the houses that were raided that were Sean Combs' houses were in his names. All the names, all the houses and properties are in his son's names. Does that have a familiar ring to it? With what I just said? <laughs> See, people, these guys move in ways, you know, that you and I, as just you know regular folk, probably wouldn't do, but they do them for reasons. So I'll let you chew upon that. You know that's that's as far as anything other than that would go into the realm of speculation, and uh, and hearsay and uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, but I find that to be interesting. That in a lawsuit, this guy is listed as, you know, being involved in drugs. And somehow or another, he's got property that he put in his son's name. Yeah, if something goes wrong, they come down and bust it. Hey, it's not my name. I don't know what happened, but what was going on down there. That's my son. You know, because uh, he can't, well, he doesn't know because he was with me. So we don't know what was going on down there. You see how that works? It's a way of, of protecting us and protecting themselves. Anyway, um, but uh, anyway, anything above that would go into the realm of speculation. But the accusations against this individual, his coincidental proximity of property to the border, it's, it, it gives you an idea of things that should be discussed on the news regarding uh, this Sean Combs thing, but is not generally, you know, and that's an interesting thing.
Michael Jackson's head of security, a guy who, by the way, had just graduated from college, and somehow or another, he's got a big security company a year later, and he's the head of security, Michael Jackson dies, and then Sean Combs hires him? Did he hire him, or was he assigned him? You know, it starts getting to that. But, uh, you know, another thing that was pointed out is that why would Sean Combs, again, other than maybe for sexual, you know, peccadillos, we'll put it that way, uh, have all of the cameras and all of the, the rooms wired up? Have his actors and actresses and buddy all those around. Why, you know, why would he want to do that? And what, and, and, and if that was the case, um, you know, why would they continue to to be involved in those kind of things? Go to those things if they knew that, which they, obviously they didn't. And they sure as hell ain't now. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no more P. Daddy parties <laughs> jumping off anymore. Trust me. Everybody, <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to stay home. Thank you, no. <laughs> but again, you're auditioning for a role in the case of bands and slots that the music record company set up for whatever reasons that they have uh why wouldn't you be set up to be put into a slot to be a music mogul who was in charge of rap music and who through that genre had access to a lot of influential important people that would be the kind of and it, and it is a known party guy so he's going to throw a party people are going to show up and um boy did they and uh this sean Combs guy fits that bill i'm sure it was discussed but who who would do that who would have the power to do that well i mentioned earlier about the universal music group and there is a guy named sir lucian charles grange born in 1960, a British record executive who has served as the chairman and chief executive officer, CEO of Universal Music Group since 2010. Beginning as an A&R staffer in the late 70s, Grange has worked in the music industry his entire career, working his way up to this current position. Um, Something that just, you know, that pops in the top of my head when I read that. I said, if he started as a, an A&R staffer and now he's a sir. Okay. I guess dreams do come true. <laughs> Boy, I can be sweeping the floor of Tower Records and the next thing you know, I'm, you know, Lord, uh, Lord Grange. But this is the guy who uh, who brought Sean Combs in. He was one of the two guys that brought him in. And he is a guy in the lawsuit that states was the one who was in charge of these parties at these houses. He was the one that was sponsoring. Um, if you guys are, are familiar with what it's like to sponsor a party, you get a sponsor for a party, I've been to parties in people's homes in Singapore that I went to where they had signage for Bacardi, they had, you know, signage for this, that, and the other, because that party, even though it wasn't a private party at home, it was being sponsored by uh, big names. And those were the kind of parties that, because the people there had, you know, it was, it, 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 it was, anyway. It was the equivalent of, of a Hollywood party, I guess you could say. So to me, to hear that Grange through the Universal Music Groups were sponsoring these listening parties or, or these under the, the pretext of listening parties and things at these houses, this guy. Okay. So when you see, and I'm going to stop it there, 
I, I just, again, you know, beginning as an AR staffer in the 70s, he's now Sir Lucian Charge for Charles Grange. And by the way, if you don't know what you get when you get, become a sir, you get titles and land. And um, okay, I'll believe anything. But this guy was the one that was sponsoring these parties being thrown at these houses. And when you got him saying, hey, I need you to go to that party. Hey, I'm having a party. At, hey, I, you imagine the CEO of Universal Music Group calls you up and says, oh, we're having a party at, at, at you know, Sean Combs' house. Come on down. You're not going to go. And that's regardless of who you are to a certain extent. Okay. So that's as far as I'm going to go with that as well, because anything outside of that leads to speculation. But you start getting into the Epstein type, you know, figures and people. And they were doing politicians kings, royalty, and everybody else, where it seems like, to me, and this is my speculation, just looking at this over here, we've, we've, we've slightly will cross into the realm of space. speculation. Those day parties were for athletes and entertainers, mostly, to get them, you know, brownstone. And there were bigger guys than Sean Combs pulling the strings behind them. So again, I ask you, do you really want to be in the music industry? Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure? Are you positive? You know, uh, 18 companies that Sean Combs was doing business with cut ties with him recently. So his empire is slowly being, I'm not getting into the why all this happened. I haven't even talked about that. I, again, that's speculation. And I have my thoughts. But the facts of the lawsuit and the people mentioned in it are all interesting characters. There's always, the mainstream media gives you a fluff piece and you think you've gotten to the teeth of it, but no, this rabbit hole is deep. And it's exposing a lot of nefarious things. And if you think that you can be in that industry and not be caught up, in its machinations, then you got another thing coming. You know, oh, I got to get my band signed. Or I got to get, you know, uh, this, uh, pro this producer's uh, credit. I got to do this. I got to do that. Oh, okay, well, hey, we're having a little party over here. Why don't you come on over? You know, please partake. We've got just about everything that you could imagine. <laughs> it looks like lunch at Hunter S. Thompson's house <laughs> during the fear and loathing in Las Vegas days. And um and um and then you're high drunk and then they get you caught up, you know, and they brownstone your ass and then they they got you. So, you know, and you, and, you know, you're not, not going to do that. <laughs> it's not, not going to happen because they got to have something on you or they're not going to be comfortable around you. You ever wonder why it is this incestuous relationship with actors and actresses and producers and directors, they all seem to always date each other very rarely and musicians. Very rarely do you see them dating outside of the industry. It's because of that. Because that's one of the reasons. Their act, this act, famous actor who married this famous actress. Oh, he or she couldn't find a regular Joe Blow. You know. Yeah. Siggy Sowers says, ever play in Oroville? Uh, yes, many. Matty Two Hats. Just make sure you don't walk in backwards to any of those private rooms. <laughs> yeah, buddy. It's what we call, in, in Japanese, there's a term called a duck with a leak around its neck. <laughs> in other words, it's setting itself up <laughs> to get served. <laughs> um, most rabbit holes have a snake in them. Yeah, 
this one's got a lot of snakes. I hear there's a lot of sketchy theories about Laurel Canyon and the hippie movement. Yeah, is, yeah. Uh, again, look at my uh, live stream. We talked about Laurel Canyon, touched upon that. Norman Thrafter. There's Jimmy Seville in the UK. He was a wrong or a wrong un and very well connected. A wrong un. He was a nasty, despicable, despicable piece of, of, of human trash. That's what I have to say about Jimmy Seville. Human trash. Evil. Well connected all the way to the top. All the way to the top. And they, again, these are facts. But these are facts that are coming up after the fact. Jimmy, he's roasting in whatever, you know, pit in the lower depths of, well, it's not for me to judge, but it's pretty much well likely. I would say that unless he had a, you know, come to Jesus moment at the very last minute. No. No. Freddie Zulov, maybe a weird question. Well, there are no weird questions here. <laughs> but there's definitely sometimes weird answers. But are you a flat earther or round? Greeting from Denmark, Freddie. Flat earther or round? Uh, my uncle's a flat earther, and he's convinced my mother. <laughs> I myself, uh, you know, uh, have other questions. I'm not so concerned about the earth itself. My interests are in the Van Allen, Van Allen belt. How can you get past, whether it's a flat earth or a round one, there still exists the Van Allen, Van Allen radiation belts, and how do you get a spacecraft made out of tinfoil through those without radiating and killing everybody on board to the moon? Answer me that one, and then I'll answer yours. Um, Siki Sauer, far-fetched, the Pokemon, a duck that has a leak is a weapon. Yeah, yeah, that's where that comes from. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Freddie, Frederick Rogers ratio again, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, uh, again, do you really want to be in the music industry? Are you sure? Maybe it's best if you're a talented person to just strive to be in the music business. You know, I think you'll sleep a lot better at night. Um, Freddie's all, that's right, we can't even get out of low earth. Again, that's not... You know, again, this is this is not flat earth, round earth, or any of those other things that people will 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 talk about. This is a scientific fact. There's a thing called the Van Allen radiation belt. And it is a not an easy thing to get through on your way to the moon. And I'm not convinced that we did so. All right. Uh Trench World Pharaohs who built these amazing buildings. Yeah, yeah. What about how to call the moon on a landline? What's this signal coming from? <laughs> That's a good one. See, you made me laugh. Bonus points to you, Northern Thrifter. <laughs> you cracked me up tonight. Yeah, questions. But I don't like, like I said, guys, I don't deal with conspiracy theories and I don't deal with anything that, other than facts. And what I've talked about tonight are all the facts. And these are the facts that, by the way, they're listed directly in the lawsuit. You, again, can look that up online, find it, read through it yourself. It's 40 pages or so, 42 pages, something like that. And aim, you know, and uh, I highly recommend you do. And see if anything that I said tonight is incorrect. Look up some of the people involved and then ask yourself the question, what is this really about? And who was he really? And why was he able to get away with so many things? Well. When you're really connected in, like a Jimmy Seville, for example, that's a fact. We know that's a fact now. Or until you cross him, an Epstein-type character, which Sean Combs is turning out to be, in my opinion. And that's the role that he was really playing. And you begin to see uh, the way things really are. And... That puts things in perspective. And so uh, a lot of great artists, see, now he, he is not well known for being generous with his artists either. So even musically, there was none of that that he had anything really to do with. He wasn't 
programming. He wasn't writing. He was having other people write and stealing that and taking stealing his song. He was well known for doing that. He was not good even in, in that regard. He was left a lot of artists like Craig Mack, flavor in your ear. If you ever get a chance, you want to listen to some good hip hop, listen to that. That was a stolen track, you know. You know, for a, for a credit stolen. He had nothing to do with that song and most of that other stuff. So this guy was an agent, is an agent. It, you know, it looks like a duck with a leak on its neck. If it quacks like a duck with a leak on probably is a duck with a leak on its neck. So there is that. And so, um, again, this is not a conspiracy story, uh, uh, Chuck, 1974. Again, what I've presented tonight are the facts. They're the facts that are listed in the legal documents. And these are people that you can look up and see for yourself. And, um, yeah, great. that was a great track flavor in your ear. So, and, um, and by the way, mismanage and, and oversaw the death of the, what do they call it? I'm, I'm, lear- I'm in the West now, so I'm learning all these new terms. G-O-A-T, goat, the god of all time, greatest of all time, goat of all time, Biggie Smalls. Um, and uh, just threw all that away, millions of dollars that could have been made. You know, if that brother was still alive today, Craig Mack, yeah. If that brother was still alive today, you know, and Tupac, the second greatest rapper of all time, in my opinion, uh, was Biggie connected? Um, no, Biggie was, no, no. Other than his neighborhood, if that kind of connect, but that's a local connect. And then, you know, no. He was a true artist. I really, I, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, if you haven't seen the video, there's a video of Biggie Smalls before um, he got signed just doing a rap battle on a street corner off the top of his head and it is the best rap pure lyric that you ever going to hear out of anybody and if you type it if you read the type if somebody took the time in the youtube channel to type out what he said and you read what he was saying it all made sense and it was told a story in the context it was brilliant and delivered in that voice with that 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 uh, presentation that this guy had pure talent before he even stepped in the recording studio and that was thrown away by Sean Cole. there's that and um northern thrifter Hendrix manager michael jeffries was a shady character yeah again a shady character and you know how he ended up if you know that story and was suspected of killing Jimmy. Jimmy wanted a break at least. That's what I've read, yeah. You you, you know. Again, um, once you get in and you sign, you make that role, they got you. And, you know, I've talked about this. And again, I've seen an artist that's come out of any of this really too positively. A few, a handful. I haven't seen too many brothers that came out of it too well be honest with you, ask Michael Jackson and Prince, you know, and um, yeah, sir, makes a lot, Um, so anyway, facts, I just deal with facts, just the facts, just like the old Dragnet, Dragnet TV series, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts, I just deal with facts, and the facts as they're spelled out, you know, just looking at it with any kind of common sense tells you that there was some, this is some ugly, you know, possible, not possible, you know, you know, again, this is ugly. This is ugly. This is an ugly thing. And this is music. This is the music business, folks. And this is the thing that you know you wanted to be a part of. I think, again, 
the takeaway for tonight. Uh, Hollow Man Team A Freestyle. I will take a look at that. Thank you. I love freestyle. See, that's why I don't like today's rappers. I don't think any of them, if you put them out on the street corner and said, okay, hit it. I don't think they could do it. Bieber and Diddy's video is very disturbing. Again, I, I'm glad you brought that up. If you don't think, if you think that those videos, and it's a series of videos, there's a video where he goes up to Bieber and starts patting him down and says, are you wearing a wire? That's for real. I, I saw that myself. You cannot get that out of my mind and tell me I didn't see that. I saw that video. I was like, what the hell? What the hell? You know, patting this kid down, asking him if he's wearing a wire. And then that little girl who couldn't have been more than like 10 or 11. And P. Diddy's talking about Sean Combs saying, I adopted her. And she's getting on the, uh, there to talk about, my name is, you know, whatever, Mary, and I'm a Sagittarius. I'm like, what the what? Have you guys seen that? Have you seen that? A whole room full of men and this little Caucasian girl. Okay. And and Sean Combs says, I adopted her. And she gets up there time, my name is Mary, or whatever, and I'm a Sagittarius. It's like <laughs> this ain't float on. <laughs> what is this? What is this? What is going on here? It's no wonder, you know, <laughs> if I was a cop and I was sitting there and I saw that video, I'd spit my coffee and donut at that. I'd be like, you know, we, we need to get into it because obviously, you know, his cover is blown now. Whatever protection he's had for whatever reasons, again, I'm not going to speculate, is blown and uh, that call will go through this time. That's creep. It's creepy. Did you imagine if I came up here on the live stream and I had a little girl with me? I said, hey, guys, I just adopted her, you know. And she's talking about my name is Mary and I'm a Sagittarius. You all be on the phone <laughs> calling the cops and fighting. Well, you should. And well, you should. Okay. <laughs> so you guys want to be a part of that? As the Japanese say, dozo. Go right ahead. Me, myself, me, myself, and I, speaking of good rap, famous rap, me, myself, and I, no, nah, I never got into it, never had wanted to have anything to do with it, and, um, and being around it and growing up in L.A. and smelling and walking it and knowing what it was all about, I am thankful that I, I, that I stayed on the periphery and still was able to have what I would consider to be a success. You know, I'm still here, I'm alive. And, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not being investigated, to tell you that much, for, 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 for things that are just horrible, horrible, horrible things. Cat Williams blew the whistle. Yeah. Uh, plenty of videos like that about uh, Biden. Yeah. 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 I'm not getting into that. I'm going to leave that alone. But again, guys, it's all over the place. It's in politics, it's in entertainment, it's in sports, it's everywhere. And um, Siggy Sour, I'm uh, sorry, Northern Thrifter, great topic, Mike. Better keep your soul, money is there. That's right. Isn't it written that what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? You know? Well, that's one to ponder upon. It's one that I've pondered upon my entire life, and I still do to this day. You know, so, but there are cats out there who do not give a, you know what, they don't care. So, hey, baby, you know, let's get our freak on and let's do it. But there's a price to pay. And in the end, very few people come out of it whole or what they thought that they would come out of it with. And I saw that. I can tell you about this party. I, I can't tell you this party where I saw this famous singer. Yeah, never mind. And you just wanted high, drunk high, whatever. And you just like, you know, damn, isn't that like, whoa, why is she, you know, bugging out? And, you know, and you're young like I was. And you're like, holy shit, this is like some adult shit. I'm like, I thought I was an adult, but this is like coming across as some adult shit you know when I, and I, you know 
And I and, and it just I was like the energy from it was like ugh. You know, it's not a dolt. I realize now what it was. It's just par for the course, and it's something that you don't. There's nothing adult about it. It's evil. Great for the passion of art, and you will get something somewhere eventually. Yeah, and even if you don't, at least you did it. A whole bunch of cats sit around talking about the album that they could have written, or the song they're gonna write, <laughs> or the guitar lesson, or the or bass, or drums that they're gonna pick up one of these days. Why not be one of those very few and actually do it? If you actually do it and follow through, that in itself puts you way and above a lot of folks. And if success comes from it, then all the more better. But uh, you weren't just uh, sitting around on a little boat while everybody else is down the stream. <laughs> Another Prince lyric. I need to be raised right to have a moral code to live by. Yeah, isn't that true? You do have to be raised right. You know, you got to have a moral center. We're talking about moral centers here tonight, and we're giving the takeaway that it's better to have your, you know, a moral center, and uh, than the money. Because <laughs> the money, because when they want to tear you down, they're going to tear you down. You know, they will write things. There have been things written of articles in the in the Daily Sun newspaper that were written about me, Mike McQueen, me. Quotes that were not that I never gave, that were not true. Okay, so I, if they're gonna lie about on me, <laughs> just to play on me. <laughs> what else are they going to lie on, you know? It's just, you know, it's because my parents lived next door to Megan Merkel's mom. And they were on there digging up, and they are going around quoting things from me. I, I don't live, I haven't lived there in years, but they looked it up to see who, you know, and somehow now that they didn't choose my brother, no, they chose me because I they couldn't find out who I was. And they lied on me. And if they'll do that without any fair fear of replication, you know, uh, uh, you know, of, of me coming at them, and what would be the use of that anyway? Everybody said, "Well, how come you didn't sue them? You know how many lawyers they got? <laughs> you better have deep pockets. You don't understand. That's why I bring it up to let you know that you know you're you're either in that club or you're not, and you see." That there's two different sets of laws for whether you're in the club or you're not in the club. And something to think about, guys. But yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. But at what price? At what price? So that is the subject for tonight. Uh, do you really want to be in the music industry? Notice I talked about industry. You can be in the music business and do just fine. A lot of us have been in the music business all of our lives, and we're doing just fine um, and not upset about it. And we can sleep at night. The fame and the fortune and all those things, they're, they're the holly tree or gold you'll see. Do you know what the holly tree is? You know where Hollywood comes from? It comes from the holly tree. Do you know what a holly tree is in esoteric terms? So again, uh, just something to think about, guys. Um, I didn't, you know, just a little something different uh, to talk about this evening. Um, yeah, studio musician is a great job. That's a music. That's what I, I you know, I, I've done. You know, um, my most a lot of my work in Japan was as a studio musician, either playing or singing. Um, and it's fine work. You get a check, go in, hit the lick, and you're out. You got money in your pocket, and you didn't have to. You know, if you if you get into some drugs or some stuff, that's on you. It wasn't because you know it was par for the course. Because you know, anyway, Jameis O'Brien, Mister O'Brien, welcome. I was wondering where you've been. How you been? 
just caught the tail of this mic. We'll watch that. I appreciate it. Thank you. And for all of you guys who catch this in the rerun, uh, I want to let you know I do appreciate you doing so. Uh, down in the comments section below, uh, hit me up with your thoughts on tonight's subject. Uh, don't forget, if you really uh, want to support this channel, uh, hit the subscribe button. I'm trying to get to 5,000 subscribers by the end of this year. I think it can be done with a little help from my friends. That's you guys. Uh, so do hit that uh, like and subscribe button. Uh, if you want to support this channel, we do have merch. We've got albums over on bandcamp.com. Uh, look up Asinoki uh, 1 and 2 or look up Mike McWilliams. Either way, that will direct you uh, to my page where you can support this channel by buying one of those albums or both. Uh, fantastic music. Uh, and uh, again, it just goes directly to support this channel. Um, Michael Watson, interesting discussion. Thanks, Mike. Yes, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking a little bit of your time to uh, listen <laughs> to these. So tonight was a little bit different. We weren't uh, talking about gear. We were talking about the industry. But again, I, I bring it up, guys, um, because it, it, it behooves me to point out to you that be careful what you ask for. Or at least be aware of what it is that you're asking for. And at the same time, be aware of what it is that you're consuming. And then also be aware that there is a deeper, what is that, the sting wrote, there is a deeper wave than this that you can't understand. <laughs> there is a deeper wave than this tugging at your hand. Yeah, yeah. There's a deeper undercurrent to a lot of this stuff that's far more salacious and frankly far more evil in its in its 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 branches just to be aware of thank you guys for showing up tonight I want to thank you so much uh for taking the time to watch and uh i will catch you this sunday coming up with uh sunday at mike's uh, where we will have another interesting topic i'm sure <laughs> if i can think of one i'm pretty sure i can uh, into the next one, you guys take care. Signing off. Bye-bye.